whether it is flexural buckling, local buckling, or torsional buckling, the failure modes of a column can be challenging to predict. After watching this video, you will be able to predict the mode of failure for the column you're trying to design and know how to calculate its strength. You will also be able to choose the best suitable shape and configuration of the column for your application. We're going to start by discussing the limit states of a column. Let us start with the most common and well-known mode of failure under compression, flexural buckling. Flexural buckling is a global failure state that depends on the end conditions as well as the geometry of the cross section. It is evaluated by using the following equation from the AISC specifications, chapter E, where FCR is the flexural buckling stress, AG is the gross cross sectional area. FCR is not the theoretical Euler buckling stress, FE but rather multiplied by a reduction factor to account for initial crookedness. This flexural buckling stress is for elastic columns that are slender and long. We can recall Euler buckling value for the pinned condition from the previous video about column analysis, link in the description down below. We can rewrite the equation for the Euler critical load in terms of the radius of gyration, R and the term LC over R is called the slenderness ratio of the column. For bulky and short columns, the inelastic columns case will apply, where FCR is equal to the following value, where F sub Y is the yield strength of the column. To summarize the equations, whenever the slenderness ratio is less than or equal to the term on the right hand side, where E is the elastic modulus, and Fy is the yield strength, then the column is inelastic, and if it is greater, then the column is elastic. To better understand how this looks like, on the lower right side, we can see a relation between the flexural critical stress and the slenderness ratio. We can see that as the column becomes shorter, the flexural stress approaches the yield strength of the column. When the points of fixation in both the major and minor axes are at the same positions along the length of the column, then the column will always buckle about this minor axis. These equations are based on experimental and theoretical studies that account for the effects of residual stresses and an initial out of straightness of L over 1500, where L is the member length. It is recommended that LC over R is kept below the value 200 because compression members that are any more slender will have little strength and will not be economical. If the flanges of an I-beam are very thin relative to their length, then the flange will buckle locally, before the column buckles globally due to flexural buckling. The same happens to the webs if they are very thin relative to their length. In order to quantify the slenderness of certain elements in a section, we categorize them into stiffened and unstiffened elements. Stiffened elements are supported at both ends by other elements, such as the web of an I-beam or the webs and flanges of a rectangular hollow section. Unstiffened elements are supported from one side only, such as the flanges of the I-beam or the leg of an angle. The slenderness of an individual element is evaluated by the value lambda, which is the width to thickness ratio. This can be equal to the width of a leg divided by its thickness, the height of a web divided by its thickness, or half the width of the I-beam divided by the flange thickness, depending on the element. The following is a figure that shows width to thickness ratios of the elements of some of the most commonly used structural steel sections and the respective limiting width to thickness ratios, lambda r. If lambda is less than or equal to lambda r, then the element is non-slender. However, if lambda is greater than lambda r, then the element is slender and the allowable compressive force P sub n should be reduced. This is done by reducing the gross cross-sectional area A sub g to the effective area A sub e where A sub E is the following. The effective width B sub E is found by using the following equations, where Fy is the yield strength and C1 and C2 
are effective width imperfection adjustment factors. Those can be determined from table E7.1 from the AISC specifications. Let us look at an example of calculating the effective area of an I-beam. So the effective area is equal to the gross area minus the reduction in the web area minus the reduction of the flanges area multiplied by 4 because there are 4 of those elements. All compression members are treated as pin-ended regardless of the actual end conditions but with an effective length LC that may differ from the actual length. With this modification, the load capacity of compression members is a function of only the slenderness ratio and modulus of elasticity. For a given material, the load capacity is a function of the slenderness ratio only. If a compression member is supported differently with respect to each of its principal axes, the effective length will be different for the two directions. Because its strength decreases with increasing LC over R, a column will buckle in the direction corresponding to the largest slenderness ratio, so LCX over RX must be compared with LCY over RY, the larger ratio would be used for the determination of the actual compressive strength. For individual columns, it is easy to use table C-A-7.1 to determine the effective length. However, when having a continuous frame, it is slightly more complicated. Because there is no bracing to prevent side sway of the frame, the effective length of any bottom column can be estimated by case F in the table while the effective length of column AB can be estimated by case D in the table. However, a better way would be to account for the rigidity provided by the girders and nearby columns to get better approximation of the end conditions and thus the value K. This would be by calculating the value G at the ends of the column, which is a function of the bending stiffness EI of the nearby columns and girders. For example, G at joint A can be calculated as follows. Similarly, GB can be computed at joint B. By using table C-A-7.2 in the AISC specifications, we can use the computed values of GA and GB to draw a straight line between them. The point at which the line intersects the middle column is the computed value of K. To use the same method for the lower columns, the value of G at pin support is recommended to be taken as 10, while it is recommended to be taken as 1 for fixed supports. If the frame is braced, then use table C-A-7.1 to compute K. Torsional buckling is a phenomena that happens to some doubly symmetrical sections under compressive loading. The cruciform shape shown is particularly vulnerable to this type of buckling. Under torsional buckling, there is no flexure, but rather a twisting about the longitudinal axis. To evaluate the strength of a member in torsional buckling, the following equation for the elastic buckling stress is used instead of the one previously shown for flexural buckling. Where E is the elastic modulus, CW is the warping constant, J is the torsional constant, LCZ is the effective length for torsional buckling, and G is the shear modulus. The values for CW and J, as well as the moments of inertia about both axes for common structural steel sections, can be found in the AISC construction manual. Flexural torsional buckling is a phenomena that happens to members with no axis of symmetry or one axis of symmetry, like the shown C-section. This type of failure is caused by a combination of flexural buckling and torsional buckling, where the member twists and bends. The elastic buckling stress for flexural torsional buckling is evaluated by using this equation, where FEX and FEY are the Euler buckling stresses about each of the axes. The remaining terms account for the twisting rigidity of the section, where x0 and y0 are the shear center coordinates of the section with respect to the centroid. The shear center is the point on the cross section through which a transverse load on a beam must pass if the member is to bend without twisting. 
To summarize, we first have to compute Fe for the section depending on the symmetry and the lowest value of applicable Fe. Next, we compute FCR based on the slenderness ratio of the section to determine whether the column will fail elastically or inelastically. Afterwards, we determine if any of the elements of the section is slender to ensure local stability. And finally, we ensure that the sum of factored loads is less than the design compressive strength, which is the resistance factor for compression with a value of 0.9 multiplied by P sub N. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.